capability for your VPC to write to the internet. You can start to add public IP addresses to your hosts. You can start to add static elastic IP addresses to your hosts as well within those public subnets. When you have an instance in a private subnet that it needs to talk to the internet, let's take an example. We have an application server. It runs Microsoft Windows, and we want to patch that server. It needs to go to the update repository and retrieve its patches. A network address translation instance, or NAT instance, will help you achieve that. It allows instances in your private subnets outbound connectivity to the internet without allowing inbound connections to those services. This is also how, for example, you can utilize Amazon's internet APIs from your private hosts within your virtual private cloud. So say we have web and application servers and we want those servers to write their logs out to Amazon's simple storage service on S3 then a network address translation instance will give you the ability for those hosts to talk to Amazon S3 without you having to allow internet traffic back in to those hosts. Let's now look at how you can integrate your virtual private cloud with your existing infrastructure, whether that's on-premises or in an existing outsourcing data, uh, data center that you may operate. You can add a virtual private gateway to your VPC and it gives you the ability to route traffic back to your premises. You then can create multiple IPsec VPN tunnels from your virtual private cloud back to your own VPN endpoints that you maintain. Within every region, we always have at least two high availability VPN endpoints at Amazon, which means that you can create two high availability VPN tunnels back to your own infrastructure. This is going to give you lots of resilience as you start to connect your infrastructure to the Amazons and build your own hybrid solutions. You can also connect up to your virtual private cloud using AWS Direct Connect. Direct Connect is private physical bandwidth between your premises and the Amazon region. Currently, you can provision Direct connect from 10 gigabits a second links down to 50 megabits per second links. We have a number of partners who will help you with this connectivity, who will hook up your premises to Amazon and give you bandwidth and latency of a known quantity so that you can connect to your Amazon infrastructure without ever having to talk to the internet. Now you can also run VPNs across Direct Connect if you so wish. Typically here, you may worry that you're using some insecure protocols across that connection, so you want to start to introduce transport layer security as well, so we give you the option to do that. You can route your VPC's internet connections back through your own gateways. Again, we talked before about having a private web or application server that needs to talk to the internet to get its updates. You don't have to route that through Amazon's internet gateways. You can route it back across your virtual private gateway back into your own data center and use your existing threat management gateways, for example. We leave that choice up to you. In fact, you can actually do both. You may have your front end web servers and load balancers using Amazon's internet connectivity and scale to communicate with your customers, to write stuff to Amazon S3 or use maybe DynamoDB or NoSQL database. But all your private transactions at the back end or all your updates or things that you want a deeper inspection of the threat, you can take that internet traffic and route it back through your own premises. Now, if you use Direct Connect, what we will also do is we will take Amazon's internet IP range and we will use BGP to push that back down to your routers so that if your internal services or your premises want to utilize an Amazon internet endpoint like S3, it can happen privately across that direct connect link. It doesn't have to saturate your own internet bandwidth, for example. So you have many options at your disposal and how you can create your own hybrid environments on how you hook them back up to your own premises and how you hook up to the internet. You're fully in control at all times. Now we built all of that within a single availability zone. The internet gateway, the virtual private gateway, all of these services are resilient regional services that you are using. 
but you choose how to deploy your solutions and applications across those availability zones. And the Amazon Elastic Load Balancer is a great tool to help you do that. It can take traffic and distribute it across any number of back-end instances. As you can see, you can have load balancers at the public side that are talking to the internet. We can also deploy those elastic load balancers privately within our virtual private cloud. Say, for example, to balance traffic between our web tiers and our application tiers. And as those auto-scaling events happen, where suddenly you need more web capacity, as you scale out, your instances will automatically be added to the elastic load balancer, and as you scale down, they'll automatically be removed. And when you suffer a failure, say the application running in availability zone A fails, elastic load balancing will immediately start directing traffic to the good subnets in availability zone B. But if we look here, we had two web servers in zone B and two web servers in zone A, and we've just lost half our capacity. Auto-scaling means that once all your customers flick over to the availability zone that's still working, auto-scaling will scale back out and give you the capacity that you enjoyed when you had access to both availability zones. So suddenly, we're building and deploying applications that can take multiple levels of failure without our customers hurting, without us having to lose capacity. Now, my one tip for designing your own virtual private clouds is you don't actually have to need any internet IP management of your own. When you use an elastic load balancer, Amazon manages the IP addresses assigned to that load balancer so that you don't have to. This means that your web servers or your web application servers can live in private subnets, they can have private IP addresses, and they receive traffic over a private IP address from an elastic load balancer. This relieves you of the burden of managing any of your own internet connectivity, which will simplify things for you. I also always encourage our customers not to provide direct management access to the instances within their virtual private cloud, but to use jump hosts, for example, to build jump hosts in each availability zone within the region, and then use them as a single place to log on to, to then actually manage the rest of their Amazon instances. This will restrict who and who cannot connect to your instances on those administration ports, which is going to make it less likely that someone can directly attack them. Let's now look at AWS Identity and Access Management Service and how you can use that. Identity and Access Management gives you fine-grained control of everything within your Amazon services. This now includes control, for example, for run instances. And what this means is you can control who can start what compute instances within your environment. So for example, you could give developers the ability only to start up pre-built development environments that you had built and control over from a security point of view. You can tag your server resources within Amazon, and you can start constructing your own identity and access management policies around those tags. Alice can start and stop servers tagged production. Bob can start and stop servers tagged database. Sue can start and stop servers tagged development. This gives you much greater granularity than you could probably do in your physical environment right now. You can always use two-factor authentication when you're using Amazon Identity and Access Management. This can either be in a physical hardware token, or it can be a soft token running in all the main smartphone platforms. Smartphone platforms. You can also test out your new policies before applying them to live using your Identity and Access Management Policy Simulator. Many customers were asking for a way of doing this, so we delivered it. Now, those capabilities mean what you can do is segregate duties between different roles. If you're a large company, you may recognize this style of management, where we have network managers, security managers, server managers, storage managers. All those people have different roles, and they all need different per permissions. You can recreate those roles and permissions within Amazon, so that as those people manage and operate your AWS resources, they're constrained in what they can do. This will reduce the chance of accidental change. It will also limit anyone who decides to overstep the bounds of their normal authority, for example. 
we've now just introduced this great new feature, Amazon Cloud Trail, which is currently beta, which is going to help you track access to the Amazon APIs and calls to the identity and access management system. It's going to increase your visibility of what has happened in your AWS environment. CloudTail records access to APIs and IAM, and it will save logs of that access in your S3 bucket, no matter how those calls were made. It's going to help you understand who did what and when, and from what IP address did it happen. You can receive notifications using the Amazon Simple Notification Service that there's new logs ready for you. A number of Amazon partners were involved in the launch of this, and what that means is that now that it's launched, you can immediately start integrating these logs with powerful security tools like Splunk, like AlertLogic, like Sumo Logic. There are many things that you will be able to use CloudTrail for. As well as performing security analysis or incident reporting, you can start to track changes to your resources by monitoring the API calls that were used to change those resources. At end of year audit, it's going to help you understand your call history, why your environment changed over time. So for example, you're looking at your change history and trying to understand the reconciliation between change requests and change events. It's also going to help you troubleshoot your operational issues. So for example, if we have a server silently failing every time it accesses the API, this is going to give us logs of those events, which is going to help you in your own operational investigations. CloudTrail is currently available in US West 1 and US East 1. We'll be rolling it out to other regions as quickly as we can. One other exciting announcement we just made on Amazon's identity and access management system is that we now support SAML 2.0. This makes it much easier for you to federate our identity and access management system with your identity and access management system. So rather than having to recreate all your users within Amazon's system, you can keep management of those users centrally, create the appropriate roles within Amazon, and then when those users need access to the Amazon environment, you federate, you receive temporary credentials for those users, which will allow them to log into the Amazon environment, manage the servers, change the VPCs, do whatever their task, without ever having to, re to recreate those users there. There's a few other features of IAM that are very powerful that I'd like to tell you about. One of the features we introduced this year was the fact that your EC2 instances can now have a role within identity and access management. So say for example, we have an application server and we want to write our logs out to Amazon S3. You don't need to store the credentials for S3 on your application server. You can just create a role that has access to that particular S3 bucket. And when your application server needs to write to S3, it does it in the context of the identity and access management role, which means we let that write happen without you needing to have the access credentials on your server. This means that if your server was compromised, no one has access to your Amazon credentials. We've all seen news stories about people who look at GitHub for checked in code and find secret usernames and passwords and all sorts of hard coded things. These features mean that you shouldn't have to do that. You can also use this within your own applications. Many of us in the past may have hard coded database login credentials, for example, into an application. You could keep those credentials in Amazon S3, and when you launch your instance, you can retrieve your database login credentials from S3 using identity and access management roles. This is going to stop you hard coding or 